name's Adrian Goldberg and you're listening to the Byline Times podcast. The Byline Times, it's what the papers don't say, what radio doesn't report and what telly doesn't tell you. This time, Brazil's insurrection, a case of deja coup. Two years after the January the 6th assault on the Capitol in Washington, D.C., hundreds of right-wing followers of the former Brazilian president, Jair Bolsonaro, launched an attempted coup in their country's capital, Brasilia, vandalising the presidential palace, Congress buildings and the Supreme Court. Order now seems to have been restored, but the parallels with the attempt to overthrow Joe Biden's election seem more than coincidental. Bolsonaro was an ally of Donald Trump, like him, a nationalist populist. And Trump's former chief strategist, Steve Bannon, has called those who sought to unseat the democratically elected government of President Lula freedom fighters. Taking a leaf from the Trump playbook, Bannon warned ahead of last October's poll that the vote might not be free and fair, laying the ground for the subsequent suspicion and claims of fraud against Lula and his supporters. We're going to hear in a moment from Rodrigo Nunes. Rodrigo is a Brazilian political analyst from the Catholic University of Rio and the author of a recent book on Bolsonarismo. I'll get him to pronounce that, don't worry. Before that, just a reminder that the Byline Times podcast is funded by subscriptions to the Byline Times. That's our brilliant monthly newspaper, which features content that you can't read anywhere else. We don't have a millionaire backer. We're not supported by a large corporation. We rely instead on ordinary readers and listeners like you to support our fearless, non-partisan journalism, exposing corruption and holding the powerful to account. You get details about how to subscribe over at bylinetimes.com. And subscriptions start from as little as three pounds a month. So do head over to bylinetimes.com if you can and take out a subscription. Welcome then to uh, Rodrigo Nunes. Hello, Rodrigo. Welcome. Hi, Adrian. And uh, you're speaking to us from Rio. Just tell us how the situation unfolded. Well, we're seeing a lot of repercussions unfolding and uh, institutional reaction to yesterday's events. The strongest reactions so far have been the state secretary for um, security in uh, the federal district stepped down. He, of course, would be the person in charge of policing in the capital, so directly responsible for the fact that the police did very little to stop people from invading the seats of the three branches of government, but also. The Supreme Court judge has suspended the governor of the federal district for 90 days while his involvement in yesterday's events is investigated. The governor was away, conveniently perhaps, on holiday while yesterday's events were happening. He is a Bolsonaro ally and he was broadly perceived as having been the person behind the lenience that police showed towards the protesters yesterday. So we can't be sure until any investigation has been concluded, but the fear is then, the suspicion is that members of the security forces somewhere along the line were either complicit in what happened or at the very least turned a blind eye. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the three lines of investigation that people are working with at the moment are first trying to identify the people who invaded the three palaces, but also to identify the people who funded the protests, for example, the people who paid for the buses that took protesters to Brasilia, but finally also to identify authorities who may have been in the know and who may have been complicit with yesterday's events. Now, it isn't in any way a surprise to anyone at this point that there would be people in the security apparatus who would both be um, willing to turn a blind eye to what happened yesterday and uh, who actually agree with the people who were demonstrating. But so far, the way things have worked was there was a a sort of gentleman's agreement and sort of uh, make-believe situation where People knew that there were individuals in the military and in the police 
forces who were supporters of Bolsonaro and who were supporters of people trying to discredit the result of the elections. But as long as they were acting as individuals, as long as they were acting in a personal capacity then not in an institutional capacity, then that wasn't a problem. Obviously, in a situation like yesterday, to separate those two things, separate the personal position and the institutional function that these individuals occupy is very difficult because obviously some of these people were responsible for the attitude of the police towards the protesters. So now this is one of the things that will have to happen. This sort of unspoken gentleman's agreement that the government would turn a blind eye to these people acting in an individual capacity as supporters of Bolsonaro demonstrating against the result of the elections, that will have to stop. And obviously, the Lula government will be walking a fine line there between being energetic and, uh, and demonstrating that it will not tolerate this kind of behavior anymore, while also not alienating further these people in the security apparatus, because it's been well known for a while that Bolsonarism is quite strong within the security apparatus in Brazil. And Brazil was a dictatorship, as I understand it, until as recently as 1985. Bolsonaro has described him as a, a nationalist populist. We've seen some of that here in the UK with Boris Johnson. We saw it at an extreme level in the United States with Donald Trump. So I'm guessing Brazil is a pretty polarised country politically, but one which, unlike the UK, unlike the US, has a relatively recent history of not being a democratic state. Yes, and that's obviously that's obviously been a huge fear in the background for the last four years or more as the military started getting involved in politics again and eventually very openly started supporting a candidate who eventually was elected. That was Bolsonaro, of course. But it's also a fear with which the military have played and have known how to play in a very intelligent way. So because people are afraid that the military might step in, people have let individuals in the military as well as the Bolsonaro administration off the hook again and again and again. And it looks increasingly like it's been a bluff all along. And even though they may have liked to intervene, and even though they may have relished the opportunity to step in for a, a military intervention, I think it's very clear to the people who could make that decision that there would be no international support for it, unlike what happened in Brazil and other places in Latin America in the 60s. So in the end, they've used the fear of a military intervention as a bluff, while at the same time using that as a promise to Bolsonaro's loyal base that maintains the status of the armed forces as an institutional force for good in the country in the eyes of Bolsonaro's base. You've written this book about Bolsonarismo. Forgive me if I've mispronounced it. Just That's describe, <laughs> just tell me what the, the features of Bolsonarismo are. One of my basic propositions about Bolsonarismo in the book is that we should understand it as the coming together of several trends that were already present in Brazilian society and have been already present in Brazilian society for a very long time. Some, some of these being directly related to the history of the country's very formation as an agrarian slaveholding society, etc. But these things, these different trends, these different elements all converged and acquired a degree of political cohesion and a, a political leadership that they didn't have before around Bolsonaro's candidacy. 
one of the corollaries of understanding Bolsonaro is in that sense is that actually the reason why we call it Bolsonarismo is relatively contingent. It's just the fact that Bolsonaro happened to be the person under whom this coming together took place. But this doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of natural affinities among these different trends in Brazilian society. The coming together of these elements could carry on now as an important political force for years to come under a different leader, which may very well happen if Bolsonaro ends up in jail or if he cannot run for the next however many years. How does Bolsonarismo act out in Brazilian society? The seven key elements that I would list as having come together in the formation of Bolsonarismo would be a very strong anti-intellectual trend support for something that you could call militarism or police militarism, a very strong support for the military, for the police and uh, law and order policies, something that you could call a new liberalism from below, which is a term that I take from the the Argentinian sociologist Veronica Gago, and um, basically means that for a huge chunk of the popular classes in Brazil, the discourse of entrepreneurialism, seeing oneself as an entrepreneur, has become common currency over the last decades. But you also have a new liberalism from above, a very strong market libertarian discourse that's seen a resurgence in the last decade or in the last 15 years, precisely as a response to the PT administrations at the beginning of the century, then you also have a very strong element of social conservatism, anti-corruption discourse, which tends to be highly selective and target corruption in the left, but not corruption in the right, and turn a blind eye to all the corruption that was seen, for example, during the four years of uh, the Bolsonaro administration. And finally, an anti-communist discourse. Obviously, it's not a new thing. It's the reactivation of discourse that was very strong in the 60s and very strong around precisely the time of the military dictatorship. But that was reactivated in the last decade. And it kind of brought all the other elements together. And in the end, made Bolsonaro, who's always, whose figure represents the legacy of the military dictatorship and who's always been a very strong anti-communist that made Bolsonaro one of the ideal candidates to kind of bring all those elements together. So in a way, you could say that there aren't any features of Bolsonarism that are particularly original in the sense that you could say, for example, in India, there is a very original element, which is Hindu nationalism, which is very unique to the Indian far right. You don't really have any original ideological features in Bolsonarismo. The features that it expresses, which are kind of universal to the far right, it expresses in ways that are very particular because of the country that Brazil is and the history that it has and the formation of Brazilian society. And at the same time, if Bolsonarismo represents something new in Brazilian politics, to a large extent, it's the importation of a lot of stuff that's worked very well for the far right in the United States for several decades. So for example, the obsession with firearms and uh, expanding access to firearms in Brazil, that is actually a new element in Brazilian politics that's very clearly imported from the US far right. But it looks like it has come to stay now in Brazilian politics, and it will be one of the rallying points for the more radicalized elements of the Bolsonarista base and of the Brazilian far right in the future in whatever shape or form it ends up taking.
There's a brilliant piece over at bylinetimes.com by my colleague Sean Norris talking about the US cheerleaders on the far right of this Brazilian insurrection. And as you describe it there, Rodrigo, clearly there are elements of Bolsonarismo which are unique and specific to Brazil and will in any event express themselves in a, a uniquely Brazilian way. But there are clear overlaps with what we might, for want of a better word, describe as Trumpism, the social conservatism, for example, the anti-intellectualism. So you can perhaps understand then why there is common ground, not just with Trump, but many others on the, the far right in the United States as well. Absolutely. And I would say that of all the far right leaders in the world today, the two who look the most like one another are definitely Trump and Bolsonaro. And I think this obviously says something about the extent to which Bolsonaro and his sons looked up to Trump and to the US outright as offering a model and a playbook and a set of moves that they could copy and they, that they could implement in Brazil. But it also says something about the kinds of countries that Brazil and the US have and what they have in common in their history. For example, the history of being to countries which for a very long part of their history, whose economies for a very long period in their history was based on slavery. That is one of the, the things that gives a very singular flavor that expresses itself in a very singular way in both the Brazilian and the US case. Before this latest attempt at a coup, I think we can safely call it that, there had been large protests, hadn't there? Complaints by Bolsonaro supporters that the election had been stolen. And I mentioned that even before the election, Steve Bannon was laying the ground for complaints that the election would be fraudulently stolen if Bolsonaro lost, the, the claim that he could only lose it if the elections were not free and fair. So, I mean, a direct mimicking of what was done in the United States, where Trump himself said very similar things, that if he lost the election, it would only be because he was cheated out of it. So this is kind of a, a viral meme, isn't it, that's going around, but a, an extremely dangerous one that is playing out, that did play out on the streets of Washington, D.C., and is still playing out now on the streets of Brazil. Yeah. I mean, not just a, a viral meme, but also there has been a lot of cooperation and a lot of exchange, particularly between the US and the Brazilian far right. Eduardo Bolsonaro, one of the one of Bolsonaro's kids, uh, who is the one who has played the, the most important role in connecting him to the US far right, he actually was in Washington at the time of the storming of the Capitol. And actually, we should remember that Trump was making these claims about the election before the 2016 election, which he won. And in the same way, Bolsonaro was making these claims about the elections before the 2018 elections, which he won in Brazil. Obviously, the point of that is you create this feeling that, well, where there is smoke, there is fire. And these guys have been warning us for a while that this could happen. So surely if it happens, then there must be something there. And this could set the scene for uh, a movement that could potentially try to overturn the result of the elections. Bolsonaro very clearly was hoping that this could lead to something like that. But what happened after the elections in Brazil was, even though there's been a sizable mobilization, and I think a mobilization that surprised many people for its size, its capillarity, and the duration, still it wasn't enough. It was big, but it wasn't enough to create the condition for, say, the military to step in or for someone to say, oh, yes, maybe we should look 
into these results. Maybe maybe there's something not kosher with them, etc. And at the same time, Bolsonaro couldn't or wouldn't lead this movement in the same way that Trump, to a large extent, did in the US. Because as soon as he lost the election, I think Bolsonaro's main concern has been staying out of trouble with the law, staying out of jail, and remaining electable for the years to come. And therefore, he didn't want to be seen as leading this movement, which has created a vacuum at the top of this movement, which kind of explains why what happened was obviously very serious, was obviously very worrying, but not worrying in the sense that it could lead to anything more serious, not worrying in the sense that it could lead to a political response that would threaten Lula's government, for example, but simply worrying in the sense that now we know that these people will be around for a long time, they will be ready to do these sorts of things again, and they certainly aren't going away too soon. But you could definitely say that as of this moment, and obviously these things could change, it looks like the more radical elements of Bolsonarism, the ones that were on the streets, are politically isolated. No one is going to support the movement in favor of overturning the results of the elections or in favor of a a military intervention, which is good news, of course, but it also means that the more isolated they are, the more radicalized they could become, which means that they will remain a destructive force, even if they no longer have the strategic or can have the strategic impact that they once had in Brazilian politics. Rodrigo, thank you so much for your time. Been really fascinating to speak to you. As I say, there's more on the links between the far right in the US and the Bolsonarismo crew. Check out Sean's article, Sean Norris's article at Byline Times.com. Before we go, just a reminder that we are funded entirely by listeners like you taking out a subscription to our brilliant monthly newspaper, The Byline Times. Get more details on how to subscribe over at bylinetimes.com. And there'll be more as well on our other platform, bylinesupplement.com, coming later this week. I know with Heidi Kuda and others as well, exploring this pretty frightening moment for democracy in South America. I'm Adrian Goldberg. This has been the Byline Times podcast. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again soon. Cheers now. Bye-bye.